Too Much Information is a production of iHeartRadio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Too Much Information, the show that brings you the secret histories and little-known fascinating facts and figures behind your favorite movies, music, TV shows, and more. We are your two Billy Joes of the bottom line. I'm Alex Eigel. And I'm Jordan Runtog. And today, Jordan... As you might have gleaned from that intro, we are talking about one of the defining pieces of post-9-11 media, a second win for one of the biggest bands of the 90s, and a seemingly universally lauded work that spans mediums. That's right, we're talking about Green Day's American Idiot. Uh, Green Day were one of my gateways into punk music. International Super Hits was one of the like five CDs that I bought as like a, a child. But I kind of stopped checking in with them around the time this came out, just because like... I had already discovered, like, quote-unquote real punk, and so by the time this came out, I was, like, ignoring pop culture, uh, basically. But, God, it was hard to ignore this this record. Yes. I still remember there was, like, a car dealership in my area that had, like, clearly contacted some anonymous band of studio musicians to just recreate an instrumental ah. version of American Idiot for their, <laughs> like, 4th of July super weekend of sales. And I was just like... Even as a child, like, the cognitive dissonance struck me. But, yeah, I was really pleasantly surprised, like, going back on it. I was like, you know what? Sure. <laughs> sure. We'll give like, this it's, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about you? Yeah, I, it's funny. The same era when you were getting into jazz was the same era where I really didn't engage with anything that I couldn't find on Nick at Night or Oldies 103.3. So my initial <laughs> reaction when you told me you wanted to do this was, I have nothing to say on this. But... After studying up on American Idiot, I realized I knew way more Green Day songs than I realized because of my high school band. We were called Pitch to Johnny. We were named after a line from the Rick Moranis kids sports movie, Little Giants. And we played a bunch of Green Day songs, stuff like Minority and J.A.R. and Basket Case. And for years, I operated under the mistaken assumption that our lead singer wrote most of those songs <laughs> yeah so, these like, were some of the these were some of the first bass lines i ever learned oh yeah minority is still like one of my one of mm -hmm. my party pieces yeah and so i assumed that those were like at least a few of them were originals and then years later i'd hear them on the radio or something and my mind would be blown so i actually know a lot more green day than i thought so i do have a soft spot for them but my main memory of american idiot specifically is from the September of my senior year in high school back in 2005. And most of my best friends were in the grade above me. And we just had one of those amazing Sandlot summers where we were just goofing off every day and it was incredible. And it was now September and they were all gone. They were at college and I felt left behind and alone. And I was working my weekend job as a dishwasher at a local restaurant. And my shift was about to wrap up around 11 o'clock at night. I was running the trash out to the bins and it was like that first chilly night of the season, you know, mid-September, summer's over. And this place served really exotic food like wild boar and elk. So my smock was covered with dishwasher and like the blood of wild game. <laughs> and so I was cold. I was smelly. I was tired. It was Sunday night. I had school in the morning. My best friends were all gone off to college. Nothing was ever going to be the same. And just so happened that the grandparents of a girl that I liked happened to live next door to this restaurant. And we'd taken prom photos there just a few months earlier. Now she was off with college men and I was covered in elk blood, lugging bags of rotting food to a dumpster. <laughs> I, was, I was in my feelings. Let me put it that way. And suddenly from the nearby parking lot, I hear one of the cars just start playing, summer's come and pass, the innocent can never last, wake me up when September ends. So if fans would like to tweet at us about this episode, please use the hashtag cold, tired and covered in elk blood. <laughs> Between that moment and 9-11, this record really comes jam packed with traumatic teenage moments. Uh, <laughs> it's an album about love and loss and paranoia and politics released after the wave of jingoistic post 9-11 patriotism had given way to anxiety and cynicism. And Billy Joe Armstrong told MTV in 2005, a lot of the record is about the confusion in what's going on today. The non-reality of reality television meets what you can see on CNN and what kind of fears are being imposed on you as the watcher. So a rich text for a band <laughs> whose breakthrough album was called Dookie. 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 Dookie? Dookie? I guess it's a Do regional one. variation. I've been thinking about this a lot because I wrote this a few days ago. 
There is a really annoying strain of liberal smarm from around this time that I feel is actually exemplified by this record. Really? Um, yeah, I do. You know, the 2000 election was kind of the opening salvo in what would sort of become this country's inexorable slide to like religious fascism, which is, you know, where we're at now. And the like response from the Democratic establishment and like bands like this were to just like make fun of George Bush <laughs> and, and be right. like, and look at Comedy Central and like, that's my Bush and all that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, knowing what like the Republicans have been up to in terms of like, and not like a judgment. Just I'm saying the quality of their machinations, like court packing <laughs> and redistricting and suppressing voter rights and like all of this. And then the liberals wing of this country was just so far behind, like chess versus checkers. You know, they were like <laughs> they were like appointing they were like appointing conservative justices who are going to like help overturn Roe v. Wade. And liberals were like. Wearing George Bush masks and going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like register to vote kids like that'll fix it. Like going back on it, it's like especially Green Day, too. It's like lauding this as some kind of a like big political work. I'm just like these guys were millionaires. This made them richer. And it did not. <laughs> it, it helped. It helped nothing. I know they were involved in like rock the vote, but like. It's weird to me because, like, I'm not, you know, like, I'm not an activist, man, but I am, like, peripherally aware. And when you think about, like, this era, people were so asleep at the damn wheel. I mean, like, this constituted lefty art. I mean, I get that it's mainstream and so it's, but but I'm like, you guys really could have tried harder, <laughs> you know? Not that I need you to bomb, not that I'm expecting Billy Joe Armstrong to, like, be bombing the Supreme Court or anything, but, like, that's it. That That was what you had. Oh, just goes to show, art can't change things. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a production of iHeartRadio. Yeah. Anyway, from the act of larceny that <laughs> precipitated the record, to its debauched recording process, to the strange second life of the album as a Broadway musical, here's everything you didn't know about Green Day's American Idiot. <laughs> Green Day was at a crossroads. One of the biggest success stories of the uh, 90s alternative culture becoming the mainstream, the band went from a trio of Berkeley-based punks bashing out odes to weed and masturbation in the East Bay's hallowed DIY venue 924 Gilman Street and co-writing songs with Rancid to a world-conquering force with February 1994's Dookie. You know Rancid asked Billy Joe to join them? No, I didn't. Yeah, he's been very open about how big of an influence uh, Operation Ivy, which is the band that two of the guys in Rancid started when they were in high school, they were like a huge influence on them. They cover Operation Ivy songs, one of them in concert all the time. And um, yeah, Rancid asked him to join and he declined because he was in Green Day. And then I think the year before Rancid's big breakthrough, Out Come the Wolves came out, Dookie came out. Billy Joe Armstrong has a co-writing credit on one of the best love Rancid songs, Radio. And he is not related to Rancid frontman Tim Armstrong, despite having <laughs> the same name and growing up in the same geographical area. Anyway, the band's... In a way, aren't we all somehow related <laughs> to Rancid lead vocalist Tim Armstrong? God, I wish. The band's pre-Dookie record for the seminal East Bay label Lookout Records, Kerplunk, sold a reported 10,000 copies on its first day of release, and that's what got major labels sniffing around. Man, between Rancid and Jawbreaker in being in San Francisco, like, the East Bay was, like, really kind of second to Seattle, Seattle yeah. around the time. I mean, people always forget that Metallica was from San Francisco at one point, you know? Kerplunk is also supposedly Serena Williams' favorite record. <laughs> Of all time, wow! That's I just found incredible. it. I was like, found it on Twitter. She was just, just. They were like, "What album can you listen to over and over again without getting tired of?" And Serena Williams was like, "Green Day, Kerplunk." Incredible. <laughs> I didn't realize until recently that the band's name Green Day was taken from an expression and I think an early song about doing nothing all day but smoking weed, having a green yeah. day. I guess I probably should have put that together. Have you made a pilgrimage to Gilman Street since you moved out to Berkeley? I haven't yet. Someone told me what? I was too old too old because <laughs> it's an all ages venue and it's like uh it's like uh, yeah someone told me i was too old <laughs> I, I, hope, I really I hope need you to spat in their face <laughs> yeah i, I am you took too your old, dentures though. out and <laughs> told them to my, go to hell my anti-teeth grinding mouth guard i have to wear <laughs> 
while I sleep. Uh, Dookie won the band a Grammy for Best Alternative Album in 1995 and was eventually certified diamond by the RIAA, selling close to 20 million copies wow. worldwide. Consequently, there was pretty much nowhere else to go but down for Green Day. Um, their moodier follow-ups, Nimrod and Insomniac, sold nowhere near as well, although they do have uh, beloved Green Day songs like Brain Stew and Good Riddance, Time of Your Life, a.k.a. The Graduates Graduating Song. A.k.a. the song that they played during the final Seinfeld episode. Really? Either... Like You're immediately, no, I'm not. Either immediately before it or immediately after, they had a montage, like a slow, in my head it's sepia, I don't think it is, but like a slow-mo montage to that. Look it up. That's why I remember watching it live. Well, by their own admission, they were somewhat creatively spent by the time of 2000's Warning, which uh, despite having Minority, as you mentioned, that song does in fact whip. That record did not sell anywhere as near as well. It, uh... Rips off the Kinks picture book. It's one of those songs. Remember that oh, song? Oh, yeah. We'll I've... live without. Dun, 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 dun. It just steals a picture book. That Kinks bass line on picture book, though, is incredible. That riff is amazing. That's up there with like, you really got me in terms of mm. how much I love it. And I would argue in terms of influence. I feel like a lot of songs have aped that. There's a, I think, a Mac DeMarco song where he pretty much just yeah. steals one of the picture book melodies or hooks or something i'm just it's a, a a rich text anyway between warning and american idiot so four years the only things that the band would release would be a japan only live ep the aforementioned international super hits collection and a b-sides and rarities comp and i think at least for insomniac they'd instituted like the self-imposed press blackout so they were very much tired of this whole fame thing at this stage yeah, I mean, when we were researching this, we were like, they, they were, it's like uh, Billy Joel felt old. He had just turned 30. And we were like, 2004, he was 30? No way. And then you realize that they got famous when they were like children. Kids. Yeah. Um, there's one important song on Warning that could be seen as a precursor to American Idiot, and that is the album's first single, The Aforementioned Minority. Billy Joe said in uh, this Mark Spitz book from 2007, Nobody Likes You, Inside the Turbulent Lifetimes and Music of Green Day. Uh, he said, we were starting to think about how there was going to be a changing of the guard from Clinton to somebody else. It didn't look good for Al Gore. It was just a sort of feeling that I knew there was going to be someone really conservative who was going to come into office. And after he was elected, we watched the culture sort of sway. Uh, the song was released in August 2000, so good on you, Billy. Nice. Yeah. Um, but they were still kind of in a in an awkward place when that record came out. You know, this is the era of new metal. Limp Bizkit and Corn are kind of battling it out for like, number one and number two of that era. Um, the In reality, 90s. they're both number two. <laughs> hey -o. That's a Green Day friendly joke right there. Yeah. The um, NYC rock renaissance was still like, it was basically right around the corner, but uh, did White Blood Cells come out in uh, I thought that 99 was, or 2000? I thought that was a one. Maybe that's Elephant. No, Elephant. Elephant was a three. Yeah. So either way, they were like old, considered old, I guess, because like Blink-182 was also the big pop punk band at the time, and Green Day were like elder statesmen. Anyway, yeah, their personal lives and intra-band dynamic had suffered from both their diminishing sales and the roller coaster ride of fame. So as you mentioned, by age 23, they were all millionaires and all married, and eventually, as it was laid out in a 2005 Rolling Stone profile, Five kids and three divorces between them. Uh, Mike Turns' second wife told him that she was leaving him the day they finished American Idiot. Uh, he later said, when we mastered the record, I cried through the entire thing. But Bill Joe Armstrong has been married to his, uh, I, what, I think a high school sweetheart. Uh, yeah, they got married like completely spur of the moment. In fact, in like 1992, right? Yeah. Adorable. But in 2001, they put out, as you mentioned, a greatest hits album and went on the road for the Pop Disaster Tour, co-headlining with Blink-182 and the Warped Tour. The fact that they released the greatest hits album, I think, is very telling because it's hard to imagine now. But in the lead up to American Idiot, Green Day very much seemed like a band that had just run its race and were now past it. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, they were now considered old. They were gasp in their 30s. And it's funny, the Beatles had a similar thing happen to them just before Sgt. Pepper when they'd stopped touring and did solo stuff, or individual stuff, I should say, for a few months. 
But these very triumphant live dates on this pop disaster tour were, as you say, a band-aid on a larger wound festering within the band. Billy Joe later said, seeing a decade of your songs laid out like that is an invitation to a midlife crisis. Suddenly we were asking, why are we in this band? Why do we want to keep doing this? And, you know, what might happen if we challenged ourselves? And Mike Dirt added, breaking up was an option. We were arguing a lot and we were miserable. We needed to shift directions. And Billy Joe had supposedly become distant from his bandmates, basically afraid to bring songs to them for fear of them being too critical of them. And all three, by their own admission, were drinking too much. Trey Cool. What a an awful name. That's up there with the, uh, the edge. Um... <laughs> With this as the context, the band returned home from this stretch of tours in September 2001, at which point the obvious occurred. Uh, Talking to USA Today three years later, Billy Joe said, I think after September 11th, I took a step back. As an artist, you get kind of like hesitant, thinking, I don't want to speak too soon. I know something's going to come out of it, but right now I don't have to process things because it just seems so unreal. Obviously, broad strokes in the period following 9-11, America swung to the right with uh, jingoism and hawkishness, hawkishnessness, the prevailing moods across the country. Uh, and Armstrong also turned 30 in 2002, as we mentioned, which put him in a reflective mood. But amidst all the personal and professional turmoil, Billy Joe decides to decamp to New York City, going right for the center of it all by himself for a month to try to break his writer's block and he rented a small apartment downtown and spent a lot of time drinking and partying in east village bars like niagara and black and white both of which i think are still there Mm -hmm. um both of those bars are owned or at least were at the time by a ryan adams associate named johnny t yarrington that sounds like a made-up name (laughs) i think that sounds like something you put in there just because you wanted to hear me say it (laughs) but sure uh and this johnny t yarrington guy rented a rehearsal space under a bar on avenue a hi-fi a kind of notorious early 2000s musicians hang out definitely like meet me in the bathroom type spot right yeah yeah so billy joe gets involved in this whole lower east side early 2000s rock scene and ends up singing on ryan adams album rock and roll which i didn't realize yeah i mean if there's a sure way to uh detonate your personal life around this time it's hanging out with ryan adams (laughs) um Uh, Jesse Mallon told Mark Spitz, I don't really know what Armstrong's full experience was, but I know it didn't last too long here. And suddenly I didn't hear from him for a while. Uh, his wife, Adrian told Rolling Stone later, Billy Joe was really questioning what he was doing. It was scary because where he had to go to get this record wasn't a place I'm sure I wanted him to be. Ooh. Mm. Uh, photographer Bob Gruen told Spitz in the book, a lot of people talk about that time and probably some of the ideas for what became songs for American Idiot were germinating during that period. Ryan was drinking a lot. I don't think Billy had come to New York to be that drunk, and so he went home. I don't think it was the inspiration he was looking for, and so he went home within a couple of weeks. I love that Bob Gruen shows up in this story. I love him. He's the guy who shot all these really famous photos of John Lennon in the 70s in his New York era, like on the roof of that apartment building in the New York t-shirt with the sleeves cut off and the one where he's given the peace sign about the Statue of Liberty. I sat next to him at Ronnie Spector's funeral. Huh. I love him. Yeah. Uh, I think Billy Joe was also robbed at gunpoint in New York during this period. Mm. Uh, It was by Ryan Adams. (laughs) <laughs> I love how Ryan Adams is like the villain of Meet Me in the Bathroom. Oh, he very much is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he got, uh, they basically blame him for giving uh, Albert Hammond Jr. a heroin habit. And that was written before all the creepy Phoebe Bridger shit came out. Yep. Yeah, overall, it's interesting. Billy Joe's aversion to violence played into this album, American Idiot, in a small way. His two sons were starting to get old enough where they were asking questions about the world. And he went out of his way to try to shield them from 9-11 coverage and said that he forbade them from playing violent video games. So you see kind of an awakening of this more politicized consciousness, or at least overtly so, around this time. Uh, I mean, it's obviously 9-11 politicized a whole generation of people but um you start to see little elements that would influence american idiot 
So with all of this in the background, the band had been working on their seventh record, tentatively titled Cigarettes and Valentines, at Studio 880 in Oakland. And one day they showed up in November of 2002 and found that the master tapes for the record had disappeared. Albums <gasps> are... Ca- <laughs> Gasp! Yeah, you have to make that, yeah. Sell uh, that. <laughs> Quelle surprise! Uh, <laughs> albums are kept on tiny discs these days, Armstrong told Time Magazine, and someone walked off with ours. Uh, Spitz obviously asked everyone in the band's orbit about the possibly purloined material uh, for the book, and most people clam up about it, like... Like, weirdly, like, we can't talk about this kind of stuff, uh, like NDA style. Uh, studio owner John Lucassi uh, said emphatically, though, it was not taken from here. Everybody's f***ing writing that it was taken from here. It was not. I mean, they took their drives with them at the time. There was nothing that was ever stolen from here. There are safes, everything. Surveillance, safes, multiple steel doors you would have to go through. Um, I guess the band has since recovered these and may release them in the future. Uh, the title track has been heard on a live record. I find this all really suspicious. I mean, the fact that it didn't get leaked, it wasn't like help for ransom or anything. I mean, it, those are like the only two reasons why you would steal tapes is to either leak them or hold them for ransom, get money for it. Do we think that Green Day made this whole thing up and it, for either did it themselves or because it makes for a better story? <sighs> Yes, <laughs> I do. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, maybe it's just very bad. Maybe it was just yeah. a really bad album. Uh, I guess to prime their creative pump in this period, at the beginning of these sessions, they were recording like polka songs and dirty Christmas songs and salsa numbers and stuff. So yeah, I'm going to go with it probably sucked. And maybe <laughs> it was an inside job and they stole it themselves. Is there like insurance on that kind of thing? Like if something goes wrong with your masters during a recording session? Like I've never heard of that, but does that no, exist? But you no. know what I know it just came to my mind that could explain why this guy is so pissed off in the in the book is that maybe they used it as an excuse to get out of recording at that studio. Oh, uh, maybe. Or they just were like, they gave someone, the studio a bad reputation too. Yeah. That's mm. Let's let's get we're gonna spawn these nine eleven style conspiracy theories about the lost Green Day album that I don't give a shit about. I mean, it's um, kind of brilliant. It's like we made a bad album. What do we do? We yeah. pretend it got stolen. If there's some kind of weird insurance thing or financial thing that we can get out of it, great. And then twenty years, we mysteriously find it, and suddenly it has this mythology around it, and we sell it. Then that's how you make a good album bad or a bad mm-hmm. album good. It's true. Well, whatever the case, it was an opportunity for the band to take a beat, and aided by their longtime producer, Rob Cavallo, they decided this lost record was not irreplaceable, uh, hunkered down for a heart-to-heart with each other that was apparently mediated by Cavallo, and decided to start from fresh. Um, He was a music industry vet uh, when his work on Dookie with the band catapulted him into the mainstream. Uh, He would stick with Green Day, but then go on to have a hand in multiple hits from other bands, including Goo Goo Dolls' omnipresent Iris. And oh, also man. multiple cuts from uh, Phil Collins' Tarzan soundtrack. I can't deal with Iris. That's a song that I, I subconsciously plagiarized in a love letter I wrote in ninth grade. <sighs> it's a good song. <laughs> what? It's a good song. Really? Yeah, okay. It, intense sidebar. You know John Mann. Yeah. It, uh, Brooklyn band guy about town, John Mann. One of my groomsmen. Uh, I call him Guy Patterson because he looks like and is just as sweet as uh, the Guy Patterson character from That Thing You Do, the drummer. Yeah, he looks like Tom Everett, too. He loves early Goo Goo Dolls when they were, like, really influenced by the replacements and were, like, closer to Jawbreaker than than Iris. And he told me this, like, heart-wrenching story about, like, Johnny Rzeznik growing up in Buffalo, New York and being, like, forced to take accordion lessons and having to lug this accordion from like the shitty side of Buffalo where he grew up to take these lessons. Um, I don't know. Just really humanized Goo Goo Dolls for me. I bear them no quarrel. I played accordion <laughs> as a little kid and tried to impress a little girl who lived down the street from me when I was like eight by playing accordion, marching back and forth outside of her house. Oh yeah, you've told me that before. Super yeah. weird. One bet that didn't work didn't know her mom came out and told me to go home said she wasn't there (laughs) 
Well, at some point, uh, Armstrong was driving along and did not hear the sound of a, a young lovelorn man playing accordion in the street. <laughs> he heard a song by Leonard Skinner called That's How I Like It. Uh, it's even uh, worse than me playing accordion at age seven. <laughs> yeah, nothing like three guitars and Confederate apology sympathists. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, I like a lot of Leonard Skinner, um, yeah, but. But uh, this song, I didn't know this song, and it contains the lyrics. It reads like a parody. It reads like a, like, are you ready for some football kind of shit? Was this um, after Ronnie Van Zant died? It probably is in their state fair, what I call their state fair years. Oh, oh yeah. It's from 2003. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Which explains why these lyrics are so fucking awful. Like my women hot and my beer ice cold, real fast car and my whiskey old, I can slow drive down an old dirt road, that's how I like it. I can turn my music way up loud, ain't nothing better than the sound of a crowd, American flag it makes me proud, that's how I like it. And Armstrong was so cheesed off, justifiably so, that he, that was the genesis of American Idiot. Uh, but apparently the notion of a punk rock opera had been kicking around his head for years. There's a profile in CMJ from 1997 that mentions um, the notion of such a thing, along with a two CD concept album as among the wild ideas that Billy Joe was kicking around in those days. Yeah, even in the early days, they talked about wanting to have a Beatle-like arc to their creative life. And now they were getting into their more experimental era. And Billy Joel later described the ambition by saying, we decided we were going to be the biggest, best band in the world or fall flat on our faces. And hilariously, there was a review of American Idiot in Slant Magazine that opened with this tremendous lead. Of all the negative effects the Bush administration has had on the world, the most unlikely bit of collateral damage has to be the return of the rock opera. <laughs> As you meditate on that, We'll be right back with more Too Much Information after these messages. The songs for the record started to take shape during these demo sessions in Oakland. The opening suite for the record, uh, Homecoming, came together out of necessity. Mike Durnt was left alone in the studio after Armstrong was summoned to community service stemming from a DUI, and uh, Trey Cool was meeting with divorce lawyers, which is a grim, grim couple of reasons to miss band practice. Dirt came up with a 30-second song and sent it to the other two, and they kind of took it as a challenge to develop their own. And that, folks, is how you get a, a mini-suite. Um, you know, the big obvious touchstones for this are, like, those Who records. You know, Quick One While He's Away is yeah. the, the biggest one. Um, they demo these tunes in Oakland, but then they split for L.A., and uh, those sessions did not start auspiciously. They arrived at Ocean Way Recording in Hollywood on April 18th, 2003, and the studio caught fire. So they went back I'm to- I'm going to say, I feel like Trey Cool had something to do with this. Well, you, yeah. It, it, with what I'm about to say, it wouldn't shock me. Uh, they got back to their hotel and, according to him, went and partied. Um, despite the fact that this was a major, I mean, they could still pull budgets. We wrapped up this stuff at Capitol Studios. Trey Cool brought something like 75 snare drums of varying vintages to these sessions. This whole, the whole tracking phase seems like a very bizarre mix of, uh, unrepentant hedonism and slowly maturing as people, <laughs> which I guess is a lot of people's early thirties. Maybe they just didn't want to make this album. Okay, first time around. All right, how do we get out of recording yeah. at the studio? Somebody steal our masters. Okay, second time around. How do we get out of recording at this Trace studio? Somebody burn it to the ground. All right, so. But things did start to fall into place once, you know, the studio blaze subsided. <laughs> Trey Cool later said that he remembered thinking, wow, we're nailing it. There was just such energy to it. I felt like Frank Sinatra was in the room with us which is a surprising choice of studio ghost. Although Bizarre I guess he thing was, to say. He was the king of, of, stu of Capitol Studios, though, I guess. But, uh, but I'd like to talk a bit more about the hedonism element, if I may. 
I think this was at their previous studio, Studio 880 in Oakland. So maybe this is when they were making their Lost Prior album. But I guess they set up a pirate radio station in the studio and broadcast their work in progress and various jam sessions just out across the Bay Area. Um, and also considering that the show Crank Yankers was at the peak of its popularity, they would also make prank phone calls and broadcast those. <laughs> and Trey Cool apparently would do stuff like call an animal crematorium in Hawaii and claim that they lost his monkey. They're just... <sighs> yeah, I guess he had to be there. Yeah. They're the Verily Brothers of, <laughs> of, of punk rock. Um, yes. Yeah. They also did this bizarre side project, The Network. They wrote an entire album in a day, this strange, like, fake, new wavy thing, and they released it under the title Money Money 2020 in 2003, and they pretended to be this fake band, The Network, and they were just masked characters with names like The Snoo and Captain Underpants, and for years, they would pretend like they had no idea who these people were, they had nothing to do with them, it was always this, like, wink-wink thing whenever they were being interviewed and asked about The Network, they'd always, yeah, I've never actually seen them in person before, yeah, I've heard about them, and they were all, like, pretending that it wasn't actually them but it obviously was so clearly they had a lot of steam to blow off during sessions for american idiot um <laughs> anyway now that we've discussed the slightly more sophomoric side of green day heigl tell us about all the ways they matured during these sessions <laughs> i guess uh you know being in a band with a bunch of guys who your bonding things were smoking weed and masturbating uh and then you've just been friends with them for like 30 years and been in a band uh, it doesn't lead to the best Our band bonded differently. <laughs> it doesn't lead to the best communication practices. Yeah, I, I guess they started Armstrong pitched essentially like weekly touch base and touch bases slash heart to hearts within the band. Aww. Yeah, it's you cute. never did that. <laughs> no, and I never will. Uh, <laughs> this is not you want therapy, go elsewhere. Uh, as reported in Rolling Stone, we bared our souls to one another, Mike Durnt said. Admitting that we cared for each other was a big thing, uh, Trey Cool added. We didn't hold anything back. He said before Billy would write a song, get stuck, and say, F*** it, the imaginary Mike and Trey in his head would say, that song sucks. Don't waste your time on it. He stopped doing that and became totally fearless around me and Mike. Billy Joe later told the Alternative Press, there was a lot of talking going on with this record. And a lot of the growing up process for us was like, dude, you've been saying the same thing to me since you were 15, and I've been hating it for 15 years. We just let it all out and declared our places and then felt comfortable in our places. And it was a very big deal because now the weird thing is we feel younger and more revitalized and we're having more fun than we ever had. Hence the prank phone calls. Of course, on the other side of that was all the drinking that they did. Uh, talking to Spin in 2004, Armstrong said, As a songwriter, I get so deep into what I'm writing about, it's almost like I have to stir up to write about it. And I think when we were in L.A. recording the record, we were also living it out. I'm not going to lie to you, got weird, Mike Durnt told them. Uh, Armstrong apparently had to schedule vocal recording sessions around his hangovers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Saying that the time period involved... Kind of a conscious effort to have a lack of conscience. <laughs> uh, there's this great anecdote uh, from Alternative Press that comes out of this, this Hollywood period. Uh, what that magazine deemed the drummer of a respected British band was staying next door to Cool and burst into his room yelling, Turn down the music. I've got a gig tomorrow. So I hear from hotel security the next day that one of this band's guys got locked in his room during the night, Mike Dern explained. Somebody apparently tied a rope around his door handle, then tied it to a nearby handrail. <coughs> At this point, Trey Cool weighs in, saying, See, you just do a slip knot on the doorknob. Then you pull it really tight against the handrail and do a good sailing knot. I've got a boat and stuff, so I'd know how to tie a knot like that really good. Without admitting it, he says, I would know how. Uh, and then for the rest of the night, I guess Trey Cool apparently just kept playing that band's music through the room so that this guy was tormented by his own music and unable to get out of his hotel room. Who uh, do we think that is? Do we think it is? I'm going to guess Radiohead. I would like to think it was not Radiohead because uh, Phil Selway seems like a cool guy. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, everybody's got to sleep. I would. I, I bet you Trey Cool I'm, is annoying as hell in the middle of the night. Yeah, I'd say Coldplay. I, you know, I was thinking Coldplay, but yeah, uh, I guess it is around 
Clocks era. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and they do seem ripe for to be yeah, yeah. tortured. <laughs> Um, Trey Cool is a ridiculous person. Uh, multi instrumentalist Josh Fries, who plays on American Idiot, uh, recalled to Spitz that he showed up to record and, quote, Trey comes down, runs up to me, and goes, Hey, if you and I were camping and you woke up with my d in your ass, would you tell anybody? And I said, Uh, no. And he goes, You want to go camping? Those were his first words to me. So, <laughs> yeah, the medium funny bits of, uh, some kid in your gym class in seventh grade is also a millionaire drummer. And that's yeah. Trey cool. <laughs> a very aggressively competent drummer. Oh. He's fine. I really like Mike Durnt. I think. He's oh, he's great. Amazing bass player. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that Durnt wasn't his real name. His real name is Mike Pritchard. And Durnt is from the sound. He used to play air bass all the time. Yeah, he is. I, I that's cannot funny. stress enough how, how, great the bass on those records is especially do, yeah. like stuff like dookie and and um yeah even even up to warning it's kind of annoying to me how they dumbed down his stuff on american idiot because i remember watching all these live performances and billy joe's like ladies and gentlemen mike dirt the greatest bass player in the f-ing world and he's just going dung 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 and i'm like man you had a lot cooler bass lines boy back in the day yeah, I mean, minority. Yeah, that's yeah. like a really long view. I mean, like the most one of the most, oh, one of the most yeah, iconic bass lines of the amazing. Of the, of the, um, yeah, he said he came up with yeah. it on acid. <laughs> yep. Yep. His family situation is nuts. This is from the 2005 Rolling Stone profile. I guess Mike Durant's adopted parents divorced when he was seven years old and basically made him choose between his rich father who was this white computer programmer and his financially struggling mother who was a native american who this is a quote from the rolling stone piece didn't hide her racial animosity and mike said i grew up with my mom hating the white man and loving me which yes yeah, that's, that's rough um that is intense anyway mike durnt has a great way of summing up his band he said green day is like sex when we're good we're really good when we're bad we're still pretty damn good. <laughs> that's, that's. I mean, they are. They are. Yeah, they are a tight band. I mean, you yeah. gotta really like watching some of the. I watched some of that Bullet in a Bible that live thing, and like, they are tight. It is not a ramshackle punk experience, man. No. They are really on the money live. Anyway, outside of the uh, explicitly political numbers on the record, the title track and Holiday are probably the most too strident. Uh, and these ambitious multi-part suites, there are two deeply personal songs on American Idiot from Armstrong, one with very well-known source materials. I speak, of course, of Boulevard of Broken Dreams, one of my least favorite turns of phrase ever. <laughs> well, I walk lowly right. Uh, God, I hate that f***ing song. Mm, it's not one of my favorites on here. It just like, looks like something that I would have written on a Trapper Keeper in seventh grade. Anyway, it was written about his uh, lost month in New York, inspired by the Gottfried Heilwin, Heinwin, Gottfried Helenwin. Um, yeah. That painting of James Dean, Humphrey Bogart, Marilyn Monroe, and Elvis Presley sitting in an all-night diner, uh, a fixture on the dorm room walls of people without imagination. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the Edward Hopper painting. It's Nighthawks, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's got like edgy, like ooh, tragic pop culture figures. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, they all, they all died before, certainly before they were sixty, possibly even fifty. They did all die young. That is interesting. You know, there's a whole mystery about what real life bar, the Nighthawks bar, was based on. Like there are all these architecture blogs and stuff. They're trying to figure out like where that bar is in new york because hopper painted it after a real place the consensus is that it's on greenwich ave and seventh in the west village Hmm. anyone ask billy joe a little something special for all you art fans out there (laughs) uh anyway in the 2005 vh1 storytellers program for green day billy joe stated that the title of the song was nicked from a painting of james dean walking alone it's funny you said it was a painting. I was thinking of that famous picture of him walking through Times Square at dusk when it's all foggy and he's by himself and looks all dejected. Like that's kind of what I always thought it was based on. Maybe he confused a painting with a photo. Wouldn't yeah, surprise me. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that'll happen. Uh, one person who believes that this song was nicked from them is Noel Gallagher of Oasis, never one to shy away from saying things that would get a, a, a non-celebrity's teeth pushed in. Uh, he criticized this song in 2006 based on having the same chord progression as Wonderwall, which oh. is f***ing rich of him. Yes. Saying they should have the decency to wait until I am dead before stealing my songs. I at least pay the people I steal from that courtesy. He did not. <laughs> Narrator voice. Well, what's the? Isn't "Don't Look Back" in anger basically imagine? And then he also he's admitted to ripping off Burt Bacharach too. But yeah, my favorite is uh, Liam Gallagher's feud with George Harrison. I can't, imagine feuding with George Harrison. I mean, I, I guess he does have some spite. I mean, this is the opposite of the. George Harrison, Mike Myers story we told in the Austin Powers episode. George was pretty open when asked about Oasis ripping off the Beatles. And he said in 1996, their music lacks depth and the singer Liam is a pain. The rest of the band don't need him. He apparently was a big fan of Oasis's uh, MTV Unplugged gig where Noel handled all the vocal duties. Uh, Liam responded to this in the sane and measured way that one would expect. He told MTV... If any of them old farts have got a problem with me, then they should leave their Zimmer frames, walkers, the British term for a walker, at home, and I'll hold them up with a good right hook. They're jealous and they're senile. If they want to fight, I'll beat them up. <laughs> it's Liam Gallagher, one of the foremost Beatles fans on the planet, threatening to beat up George Harrison. Uh, I still love the Beatles, and I still love George Harrison as a songwriter in the Beatles, but as a person, he calls him a nipple, which is a, an expression I don't think that exists. I think that's just like when Liam called Noel a potato. A potato. I, th yeah. I think it just sounds good. Um, yeah, this doesn't have to do with Green Day, but when there's a Beatle or an Oasis anecdote to be shared, I try to take the opportunity. I just want to in interject. F***ing Morning Glory, what's the story of Morning Glory, has two songwriting lawsuits connected to it. Shaker Maker wound up costing them $500,000 because of the similarity to I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing by the New Seekers. And they lost 10% uh, of their royalties to Stevie Wonder uh, based on the track Step Out, sounding similar to Uptight, Everything's All Right. Stevie Wonder, it's worth noting, very much alive. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, speaking of bands that ripped off the Beatles... Green Day wanted to end the song Boulevard of Broken Dreams with a nod to the Sgt. Pepper closer, A Day in the Life, but producer Rob Cavallo talked them out of it. He later said, originally the band wanted the outro to be something like the huge crescendo at the end of the Beatles, A Day in the Life. Then they thought they'd maybe try it with calliopes and circus music and craziness like that. I told them, look, you're a rock band. Let's just do it with guitars. My favorite anecdote about the Boulevard of Broken Dreams, though, is that they used it in the office. Dwight and Andy sing it at the holiday party one <laughs> in one episode. And apparently Billy Joe literally didn't get the memo, uh, or maybe it was during his drinking years, because he had no idea that it was used in the office. And then a few years ago, he was binging the series, like 10 years after it aired, and he was shocked to just find one of his songs in one of these episodes, <laughs> which is great. Yeah, it's kind of adorable. <laughs> yeah. Wake Me Up When September Ends, meanwhile, was written about the death of Armstrong's father from esophageal cancer when he was just 10. Apparently the title comes from something that Billy Joe actually said, I guess. Following his dad's funeral, he locked himself in his room and said, wake me up when September ends. His dad died in September. Yeah, he and his five siblings were raised by their mother who worked at, as a waitress at a 24-hour restaurant called Rod's Hickory Pit. Uh, she worked a lot of graveyard shifts, he said. My brothers and sisters were put in a position where they had to grow up really fast and become parents to me. If there's a song on American Idiot that veers away from the story for the album, it's that one. He, This is on Storytellers, he said. It's a personal thing. I've never tackled an issue about that, about singing about my father. It's hard to sing, but definitely therapeutic because it deals with the passing of someone you love. The seven years have gone so fast line is thought to maybe deal with the gap between when his father died in 1982 and Green Day's first EP in 1989. Um, it's just a theory. And 
uh, the 20 years has gone so fast line is the period between when his dad died and when Billy wrote the song in 2002. So it's sort of like the theory of American Pie being written about Don McLean's dad, you know, for 10 years we've been on our own. Um, perhaps unfortunately for him, though, despite this song's also heavy handed Iraq war themed video, this song is popularly remembered for neither his father nor the Iraq war. Because it came out in June 2005, and then when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans two months later, this song became associated with that, uh, which you can trace back to a single blogger uh, by the name of Karma Girl, a.k.a. Zadie. Uh, she posted an edit of this song paired with TV coverage of Katrina and put it up on her website, which is still... Uh, you could Smashface.com slash vlog. I don't know, I just got that from Wikipedia, and it went viral. Uh, oh no, I got that from the New York Times, of all places. Surely the first time smashface.com slash vlog appeared in the August pages of The Grey Lady. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess it went viral, and uh, became like a, a sort of anthem for the recovery following that disaster. Um, they performed the song days after Hurricane Katrina on React Now, Music and Relief, which was a benefit concert broadcast on MTV. And a live version of the song recorded in September was released soon after and dedicated to the hurricane's victims. I read dedicated. I wonder if proceeds went to them or they just said, this is dedicated to you and kept the f***ing money. They had to have donated something. Uh, they also performed it for some reason with The Edge uh, at the first game played in the Superdome in New Orleans after the hurricane. I mean, it's statistically proven that if you have a charity single and you loop in any members of U2 it's gonna do better I mean there's something about the presence of U2 that just provokes guilt and makes you want to fork over cash so yeah <laughs> I'm just thinking about like a lesser disaster and they're like all sitting and like, like Adam on Clayton the, I was gonna say yeah they're all sitting around and they're like alright we can't get Bonner the Edge but we can get Larry or Adam <laughs> <laughs> to play really anonymous bass guitar and drums that could easily have just been programmed by literally anyone in the world. Oh, I just love these bands where it's like Black Keys or someone where it's like half the band is clearly doing the work. The other <laughs> half is just kind of there. And you do such a perfect example of that. Just like you've got the guy with the big voice and, the, and who just clearly will put his own face in front of everything. And then you've got the guy who lucked into one of the most identifiable guitar sounds of the past 50 years. And the other two. And the aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, the other big thing about Wake Me Up When September Ends is that it's become a meme online starting in September uh, with people bothering and tagging Billy Joe about it enough that he mentioned a vulture at one point. It's like when Jesus was born on December 25th, people go, hey, it's Christmas time. Went, okay. Uh, when the Easter bunny comes, people go, hey, it's Easter. When September comes, people go, hey, it's that guy in Green Day. And he joked that he wanted to write a song called Shut the F*** Up When October Begins, which is medium funny. Yeah, I think of that whole phenomenon as being like the seasonal bookend to the It's Gonna Be May, Justin Timberlake meme. Yeah, 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 mm. yeah. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back with more Too Much Information in just a moment. Jesus of Suburbia is the, uh, I guess, one of the only parts of this that gives it its, like, quote-unquote rock opera thing. I don't know. Yeah. Do you, here, but here's a bigger question. Do you think this counts as a rock opera? No. Yeah. Neither do I. They're thematically <laughs> linked, but, like, it's not, I don't think it's a real concept album. But we mentioned The Who earlier. Uh, man, you want to see a great Who clip. Did, I, did you see that Rock and Roll Circus performance? Oh, have you seen that's that? That's one of my all-time... Of course I have. That When they're doing a quick one? Yeah. That last... When they're doing the last You Are Forgiven yeah. part you is like one of my favorite forgiven. rock moments of that all live, time. That live performance whips so much. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that they... Green Day could never... Well, <laughs> like, that's why the Rolling Stones never released it. I, they got I did know that. off the stage. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Jesus of Siberia, compared variously by the band to A Quick One While He's Away and Bohemian Rhapsody, is uh, Armstrong's... <laughs> get f***ing serious, guys. Uh, is, is Armstrong's favorite Green Day song, apparently. 
Uh, he also name checked Greece when talking about inspirations for the album as a whole, which I think is hilarious and kind of adorable, but also one of the least punk things I've ever heard. The fact that the female character on American Idiot is called What's Her Name mm. would definitely cause this album to fail the Bechdel test. That's for sure. Yeah, everyone talks about sort of the more obvious touchstones, but I guess he's a big 50s guy. Uh, remember yeah. he did that whole Everly Brothers tribute album? No, I knew he was a big Everly Brothers fan, but what did he do a song on it? Yeah. Him and Nora Jones. Whoa. Called for an album called Wait For It Foreverly. That's actually not. I mean, it is bad, but it's also <laughs> a, it's very clever. It's also it's not even one of the it's not even one of the um like big Everly Brothers songs. It's the album um Songs Our Daddy Taught Us, which are like all old traditional folk songs. Interesting. Wow. So yeah. That's huh. interesting digression. Anyway, uh, Jesus of Suburbia is the band's second longest song after the other multi-part suite on American Idiot, Homecoming. Billy Joe had had a rudimentary version of the song kicking around for a while, and the sweet part of it was sort of stitched together over uh, extended jams the band has. Uh, the guitar sound in particular on that, I read, was achieved by using the old 1970s classic rock technique of when you by amp or split the guitar signal and you run half of it directly into the mixing board and then the other half into a tradition like an amp a mic'd amp setup and then you blend the two of those signals together did uh mark boland do that for the yeah. like, t-rex stuff yeah, yeah a lot of the t-rex stuff has that uh kathleen hannah of pioneering riot girl band bikini kill was asked to sing the aforementioned female part of what's her name which doesn't exactly square with Riot Girl, but I'm sure she got some cash from it, which was nice. Um, <laughs> she, although she was told to sing like a female Billy Joel, which sounds like a terrible experience for someone. Uh, <laughs> but they called her up just because they liked Bikini Kill, which is nice. Good. Here's a great quote from Billy Joel about his process. He told this to MTV in 2005. Right after I came up with the phrase American Idiot, I came up with the album's protagonist, Jesus of Suburbia. I felt like it crossed that line between church and state or politics and religion. I thought, how would I interpret the Bible even though I've never really read it? Incredible. But he considers this song the best that he's ever done. He told Vulture in 2021, I'm tooting my own horn, but I think it encompasses so much about my life and friendship and family, and it's flamboyant and big and bombastic. It's one of those moments where I was feeling like I wanted to take a big risk. It's so fun to play live, seeing how the entire crowd sings along. It's just one of those songs. But when it came to actually getting the label on board back in 2004, that was a bit of a trickier proposition. He'd say, American Idiot was such a difficult album to explain to people before it came out. I would be talking about things like nine minute songs and the response from Warner Brothers was like, okay, they've finally lost their minds. <laughs> the band could barely bring themselves to say the phrase punk rock opera themselves for the longest time because it just sounded so bloated. Yeah, Billy Joe has a lot of what I like to call first bong rip ideas. Um, <laughs> which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Just, like, <sighs> Jesus of suburbia. That's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the videos for this record were all directed by veteran director Samuel Bayer, who counts among his many credits Nirvana's music video for Smells Like Teen Spirit and Blind Melon's No Rain. Um, I guess all the videos for this are thematically connected. In the American Idiot video, it's basically kind of a live shoot. The band gets sprayed with green liquid after the stripes of the American flag melt. In Holiday, they they drive... I know, just high concept stuff, guys. In Holiday, the band drives around in a 1968 Mercury Monterey convertible. It is a sweet car, which eventually stops in the same field that Boulevard of Broken Dreams begins in. For that video, Bayer opted for older school visual techniques like rear projection instead of green screen, and he uh, would like physically attack the film negative, like scratching with razor blades, pour coffee on it, put out cigarettes on it. Uh, all shit you can do in <laughs> iMovie these days <laughs> in 30 seconds. Uh, for the Wake Me Up When September Ends video, um, which, given his CV incredibly Bayer calls this hands down the greatest thing I've ever done he did smells like teen spirit yeah bold Long words Islands, no rain wow he's done okay I mean did you look up this guy's no 
aside from Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is like one of the most, the most, I don't know. What do you think? Iconic videos in the 90s. Shortlist, yes. I feel like visually there are songs like baby one more time for example like i feel like there are other songs that visually have more of an impact even though i think the song is like top three era defining songs of the 90s and the only reason i'm not saying that's number one is because i'm sure there's something i'm forgetting right now but yeah obviously that video is up there doll parts for whole uh oh we mentioned this later bullet with butterfly wings um we did some stuff with uh, Marilyn Manson. That's that was a terrible idea. Blink One Eighty Two, Stay Together for the Kids. Oh, um, this was all pre American Idiot. Yeah, and he likes all of those things less than the Wake Me for September Ends video. Anyway, um, they cast Evan Rachel Wood and Jamie Bell in speaking roles. And I guess they aimed for a look similar to 1979, the Smashing Pumpkins video, which is all kind of like oh. the camera's rear facing back at a person. Uh, I don't know where else to put this. The record's cover of an arm holding a heart-shaped hand grenade. Ooh, first bong rip idea. Should have stayed in the drafts folder. Uh, was inspired by Saul Bass's poster for The Man with the Golden Arm. Um, I Dude, Vertigo too, right? Like all those great. Oh like, yeah, all the best ones. Anatomy posters, of a Murder. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, yeah. It was done by an artist named Chris Bilheimer, who, uh, despite feeling that red is the quote most overused color in graphic design, rendered it in red, black, and white. Uh, this was, of course, three years after the White Stripes had done that exact same thing. So, draw what conclusions you will from that. The band also leaned into that color scheme at this time, started wearing black and white and red outfits on stage, uh, like sort of like suit, tailored suit looking things, for which they adorably went on a band diet while they were recording the album to fit into. Uh, Billy Joel also started wearing a lot of eyeliner in the Mark Spitz book. uh, (laughs) A friend of the band named DJ Miss Guys uh, said, Billy Joel really does wear more eyeliner than most drag queens now, but they all had the face for it and could pull it off. Um, Courtney Love is also quoted in this book as saying, this level of fame has been very good to them. Billy Joel looks absolutely beautiful. You know how when people get super A-list, their face gets prettier? I think it's perception. It's something that happens in your subconscious. But he looks stunning. He looks like a beautiful girl. Why so, did they ask? I just... This? It's like de rigueur that you have to ask Courtney Love to say something ridiculous if you're making a book about anything about the 90s. American Idiot became Green Day's first number one album in the United States, selling 267,000 copies in its first week of release, the biggest opening sales week. Dookie was a bit of a slow burn, if memory serves. Um, the album became 2005's fourth highest seller overall, moving uh, over 3.4 million units and stuck in the top 10 of the Billboard 200 for over a year following its release. As of 2017, its worldwide sales were something like 16 million copies. That is really wild that these scrappy pop punks notch two of the biggest selling records of the past 30 years. Yeah, but, you know, they're really trying it with me. Their press release for the album declared it, quote, neck and neck with Sgt. Pepper is the greatest (laughs) album of all time. I can't stand by and let that aggression stand. I mean, yeah, just leave. You don't even have to just let them shoot themselves in the foot with that. Come on, guys. In his retrospective piece in Kerrang! last year, Ian Woodward wrote, in terms of its sales figures, American Idiot can be justly regarded as the world's last truly blockbusting rock album, a title it'll likely hold forever. Never again are a group playing this kind of music likely to sell records in these kind of numbers. What do you think of that? You think? There's uh, any one that came later? Do you think like no? I Imagine actually look. I actually or something. No, I actually looked this up, and I I under heavy duress have to hand it to them. This is probably the last pure rock record to do these numbers. Yeah. Um, who sells 17 million? I mean, the thing is, this came out eight years before Spotify, right? Yeah, so yeah. that was an eight year window in which someone could have beat it, and uh, no one did. Um, I think the only other bands that I could really think that would come close would be like Queens of the Stone Age or Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I looked up Queens of the Stone Age because I thought Songs for the Deaf was a way bigger hit than it was. No, not nope. not at all. I was extremely wrong about that. And then what's the Chili Peppers record from 2000 from around this time, by the way? City of Arcadium? Was no. 2006, I thought. Yeah. Uh, 
by the way, it was 2002. By Saving the way, Arcadium, I thought by, was the big one. By the way, went double platinum. Let's see what Stadium Arcadium did. Four times platinum. I yeah. I mean, who who sells 16 million copies now except for like Adele and Taylor Swift? I yes, I begrudgingly must hand it to them. Uh, this was a simpler time, not far removed from when the Dixie Chicks were crucified for slandering George W. Bush post 9-11 for just saying he was ashamed. They were ashamed he was from Texas. Come on. God, remember that? Anyway, the record's quote unquote incendiary content uh, resulted in it not being carried by some retailers, notably Walmart, which is hilarious because when I was trying to verify that, if you search American Idiot and Walmart, all you get are current sales links selling 75 various reissues of American Idiot on vinyl at Walmart. Uh, some radio stations declined to play the song, not on the basis of the homophobic slur that Armstrong uses, but rather because it uses the word redneck. Really shows where America was at the time. Uh, I guess at one point they guessed it on Letterman with John Kerry, like the day before this album dropped. I do not remember this. They also performed the title track. I thought it was on Letterman. Maybe it was on a different show uh, in a Bush mask in the weeks leading up to the 2004 election. And Billy Joe later said, we did everything we could to piss people off. But, you know, I mean, if you actually listen to this record, it's really just the title track and Holiday that are overtly political. And <sighs> yeah. the rest of it is just, you know, a thematic narrative about those characters, St. Jimmy and what's her name. Obviously, they were outspoken in interviews and on stage at concerts and stuff. But the record itself uh, isn't that inflammatory. And... Billy Joe said as much in the Rolling Stone profile, and it's a sentiment that would probably get him canceled, if not crucified today. He said, in the U.S., that puritanical feeling takes over. It's not your business who I vote for. It stops people from thinking so much. They developed a hard-nosed opinion, and then suddenly they stopped taking in information. I don't have a million things against conservatives. Johnny Ramone was a very nice guy, but a total Republican. I still like the guy. That's where it gets screwed up. If someone believes one thing, it turns into us against them. This album is about feelings. I didn't want to make a Rage Against the Machine record. I wanted to make an album of heartfelt songs. Uh, last great Billy quote about all this, this time from the Alternative Press. I've always written about what's around me, whether it's about being a kid masturbating in front of the television or now being scared to death in front of the television. Yeah, what I mean... Think of all that. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to cut in my thing earlier about like this being like the most low stakes political agitprop of, of all time. I mean, like, of course you don't want to make a rage against machine record. You're not smart enough. <laughs> like this is, I, it bothers me because like, I really do love the writing, but like every single thing that comes out of this guy's mouth makes me want to molly whop him, you know, just like go upside his coal rimmed little head. Uh, <sighs> It's, you know why? It's because he's rich. It's because he's been a millionaire since he was 18. Like, that's why you can afford to say things like, I don't want to be political. I just want to write songs about my feelings. Like, different time, Rich white dude. guy from California. That's why he says that shit. That's why he can be friends with Johnny Ramone. Although, you know, I guess admittedly he made a bunch of empty noise recently about wanting to renounce his U.S. citizenship and move to the U.K. because of Roe v. Wade. So I guess he's got that going for him, which is nice. Um, in 2005, American Idiot won a Grammy Award for Best Rock Album. It was nominated in six other categories, including album of, the, album of the Year, though because of a quirk in the way the Recording Academy structures the eligibility windows, Boulevard of Broken Dreams won Record of the Year the following year. Video for Boulevard of Broken Dreams won six MTV Video Music Awards, making it apparently the only song to win both Record of the Year at the Grammys and the MTV Video Music Award for Video of the Year. God, what a quainter time when wow. that mattered to people. Um, so, now we have to get into the musical. Uh, at some point, a director named Michael Meyer, Mayer something, is making the 2006 horse girl drama Flicka. <laughs> and for some reason, he is obsessively listening to American Idiot on his drives to and fro from work. His rock-infused take of Victorian era teen angst called spring awakening was a hit on broadway at this point and it would go on to win him a tony award for directing in 2007 and i guess he was being interviewed about that musical by variety and they said do you think there'll be any more rock in musicals and he answered well obviously american idiot could be turned into a musical somebody's probably already doing it 
narrator voice. They were not. But Amadeus star <laughs> and producer Tom Hulse, Tom Hulsey, I don't know how you pronounce that guy's name, guy who played Mozart in Amadeus, read that article and suggested that Mayer move forward with the idea. And within weeks, Green Day had flown out to New York to see Spring Awakening and meet him. He told the Orange County Register in 2012, uh, we spent the whole night talking at this little theater bar. The incongruity of seeing Billy Joe Armstrong in a bar with Nathan Lane and Bernadette Peters was bizarre. Amen. Uh, bolstering the album's 57-minute runtime with four songs from the European-only release, Mayer was given free reign by the band to do whatever he wanted with the material. They didn't see anything from it until a 2008 reading, of which Mayer recalled, I looked over and all three were sitting there with tears streaming down their faces, which I will never forget. It was one of the most satisfying moments in my life. After a run at the Berkeley Repertory Theater in 2009, the show moved to the St. James Theater on Broadway, opening on April 20th, 2010. <laughs> Decent 420 joke there. Yeah. Uh, a show for which Donald Trump was apparently in attendance. I wonder what he thought. Did we get a capsule review from uh, DJT? Donald Trump loves musicals. Um, he was also at the opening night of Studio 54. Hmm. He was like, I think he was like the first person there. Like he was early to the party and they were still like getting stuff set up. Jesus Christ. Uh, the show closed a little over a year later after 422 performances. Oh, so close to another 420. Come on, guys. Oh. You should have canceled <laughs> two of them. 422 performances, uh, some of which saw Billy Joe appear as St. Jimmy. Other guest stars playing that role included fellow Bay Area punk Davey Havoc of AFI uh, and Melissa Etheridge. Um, the show's cast recording won the 2001 Grammy Award for Best Musical Show Album, although it was ineligible for a Tony Award uh, because less than 50% of it was written for the adaptation. But it did win for Best Scenic Design and Best Lighting Design. So a lot of tech crew people were happy about that, I guess. Uh, American Idiot Fever continued to burn unrestrained through this country as of at least 2011 when production company Playtoned option the musical for a film with Mayer attached to direct and Universal Pictures in talks to distribute. Armstrong was asked to star as St. Jimmy in it, but he was waffling on it, and the film was initially slated for a 2013 release. By July of 2013, Mayer was saying at a performance of the musical, though, that the adaptation was still happening, but was delayed due to, quote, Hollywood bullshit. In March of 2014, I bet it was, buddy. In March of 2014, playwright, this is wild, Roland Jones, who is a playwright who is a Pulitzer finalist for one of his plays and an Emmy nominee for episodes of Friday Night Lights, he was apparently tapped to write a screenplay for this. And at that time, he said, I'm going to finish it by the end of the month. Uh, fast forward over two years. In October of 2016, Billy Joe tells NME that the film had moved to HBO and was getting more rewrites and that he would be starring in it. And then fast forward to February 2020, where he told NME that plans for the film adaptation had been pretty much scrapped without elaborating. So, sorry. <laughs> I guess all you Green Day heads. I'm kind of amazed that they it didn't run longer. Green Day Natics. What do you call Green Day fans, Jordan? This isn't a bit. I'm not doing a bit. Greeners? <laughs> Greeners. Uh, Green Day has put out six records since American Idiot, including 2012's Astounding Run, where for some reason they released, they pulled their Kiss move and each released a solo huh. album, Unos, Dos, and Tres. Uh, their follow up to that, 21st Century Breakdown, did really well, weirdly. I looked up the sales records for that and it did way better than I expected or remembered it. I don't remember a thing about nope, that. Not a was there a single or did it just sell really well? Uh, I think the single was the one that was like <laughs> um, Oh, that one? Yeah, yeah, you know, that old chestnut. <laughs> won the Grammy. <laughs> Sold four million worldwide. God, Green Day cannot be stopped. This is where I have to put aside all my cynicism. Because one of the things that I do and have always loved about this band is that live they pull kids up on stage and hand over their instruments and either teach them how to play one of their songs or teach them how to play. Earlier on, it was that Op Ivy song, Knowledge. And multiple people who are currently musicians have come out and been mm -hmm. like, this was like the biggest moment of my life. 
the 1975's Matt Healy uh, said that the moment he became determined to become a musician was when at 13, the band pulled him on stage to play bass with them in front of 10,000 people at the Newcastle Arena. Uh, Billie Eilish was not even born when Dookie came out. She said it's one of her favorite albums and remembers her brother Phineas getting a pair of Trey Cool's drumsticks at a Green Day concert. Oh my and God. Billy Joe Armstrong said that even Ed Sheeran saw them at uh, Wembley Stadium performing Time of Your Life. And that was a big formative moment for him. Uh, that kind of sounds like an Ed Sheeran song. It does, yeah. And you know what? Talk a lot of shit in this episode, but more music is not is rarely a bad thing. And if you're inspiring kids to pick up an instrument and be in a band and change their life, I'll take any amount of your bullshit. What do you do if the more music is bad music? And then I just don't listen to it. <laughs> and I'm I'm catty about it on my podcast. <laughs> um, there's a great anecdote from that Spitz book that I guess we have to leave on. In March of 2005, Corey George, a nine-year-old kid in Wales, was in a coma following a car accident. He woke up after his mom played him the American Idiot album. He literally woke out of a coma because someone played him American Idiot. Probably would have kept me in, <laughs> but uh, no. You know what? If nothing else, they've got that going for him, which is nice. Which is nice. <laughs> oh, I've made so many enemies. I swear I wasn't going to be this mean. I swear I didn't come in guns loaded. I'll cut most of that. All right. Thank you, folks, for listening. This has been Too Much Information. I'm Alex Heigl. And I'm Jordan Runtug. We'll catch you next time. Too Much Information was a production of iHeartRadio. The show's executive producers are Noel Brown and Jordan Runtog. The supervising producer is Mike Johns. The show was researched, written, and hosted by Jordan Runtog and Alex Heigl. With original music by Seth Applebaum and the Ghost Funk Orchestra. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. For more podcasts on iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 